So I don't have to shout. Hello, good morning. <laughs> I'm Catherine Luther. I'm the director for the School of Journalism and Electronic Media, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to, let's see, the College of Communication and Information Social Media Week 2020. This is actually our ninth year of doing Social Media Week, and it's just unbelievable because it's gone by so quickly. Um, I'm sure that you all will agree that social media has had a huge impact on our everyday lives, right? And so we're going to have a number of panel sessions and speakers this week talking about both the positive and negative aspects of social media. So I hope that you all have an opportunity to attend some of the other sessions and speakers this week, take a look at our program because it promises to be a good one from social media and news content to corporate branding to, of course, disinformation and information, uh, misinformation, rather. So welcome. I'd like to also thank Dan and Melanie Peterson. Uh, they are the generous donors who make Social Media Week happen. All the delicious donuts out there and coffee, please eat, because it's t thanks to them that you have that. So um, enjoy the panel. And so without much delay, I'm going to actually introduce the panelists here. So first, on my left here, is Dr. Jessica Maddox. She's from the University of Alabama, and her expertise is in the area of digital media and the intersections with culture, society, and technology. And then next to her is Brandon Hollingsworth. He's the news director for WUOT 91.9 FM, um, the public radio station here. And then we have Dr. Mark Harmon. He's a professor in the School of Journalism and Electronic Media. He teaches and also does research in the area of political communication. And then right here we have Damien Ruck. Damien is a postdoc fellow in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, Damien here at the University of Tennessee. He got his PhD from the University of Bristol in the UK, and his area of expertise is in computational science, computational analytics, um, and the relationship between cultural values and democracies, as well, of course, misinformation and disinformation. So it's going to be a great panel, and so please w um, join me in welcoming the panel. Panelists here. Okay. 
thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you to the organizers for arranging this event. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for coming. So I wanted to use my uh, opening remarks to point out something that's obvious but sometimes can be forgotten, which is that disinformation and social media are actually you know, different things. So disinformation is, is very old. You know, we've had propaganda for millennia. But this particular epoch of disinformation that we're in at the moment is unique because of social media, which is the new thing. Um, and another thing that I, I might be able to get to by the end of my remarks is that there's another new thing about this current period of disinformation, which is something that Rand Corporation calls truth decay, which can be summarized just as now we all have our own facts. And this, this disagreement about facts, they argue, is, is unique to this particular time period. So just to emphasize um, that disinformation is not new, uh, there have been many periods where you know, disinformation in media have, has been prominent in history. Um, and I've just chosen one here just to emphasize some of the similarities between these time periods. So in the 18, 18, 1880s and the 1890s, it was the period of so-called yellow journalism where um, you know, prominent uh, newspaper owners such as you know, Pulitzer and Hearst competed for advertising revenues, subscribers, and as a result, news got very, very sensationalized during that time period. But there are other things that this, this time period had in common with our current time, which is that there were high levels of economic inequality um, there was an ongoing technological and informational revolution. So you think in those days about you know, railroads, think about uh, urbanization, and things like that. And then there was an informational revolution. So the, um, uh, the subscriber base to newspapers went up a lot during this period. Uh, we had populism during this time period. So the People's Party was very popular. Like, think of like William Jennings Bryan and people like that. Um, and there was also this kind of culture war where people were disagreeing about norms and what values were, what norms and values were, um, were correct. So the People's Party, for instance, represented, uh, you know, like uh, agricultural interests who were concerned about, you know, the decadent norms of these new, these new urban dwellers. But the thing that's new and the thing that uh, we're all talking about this week, because it, it's social media week, is social media. So why social media has changed the game in terms of disinformation is that, number one, it gives you this cheap, decentralized way to propagate messages. Um, it, it reduces publishing costs dramatically. Anyone can go viral. And uh, it takes kind of the traditional gatekeepers of like big media companies out of the game. There's this big data targeted marketing aspect to it. So because when we all use social media, all of our activity is logged and can be used to, um, for uh, companies and people with access to the data to learn about us. This is why um, what Cambridge Analytica did a couple of years ago was so problematic. Um, it's very easy to assume a false identity on social media. So it, anonymity is easy to come by. So if you, if you look at what, for instance, the uh, Internet Research Agency from Russia did, during the 2016 election, um, they very easily masqueraded as US citizens or local newspapers and all kinds of trusted sources of information. And then there's the fact that it's just new and unregulated. So we haven't had social media very long. We're talking less than two decades. And we don't really, we haven't figured out what's acceptable to do on social media yet. You know, we just, is political advertising okay on social media? You know, Twitter say no, Facebook say yes. And we haven't ironed these things out yet. So an important question and a question that I've been interested in is, are these social media campaigns of disinformation actually effective? Do they change public opinion? Um, and the case study that people use to, to study this question is the case of Russian interference during the 2016 presidential election here in the US. Um, because you know it's of interest to uh, people in the U.S., but also we happen to have a lot of data to to, to study this question. And some studies say yes, 
some studies some studies say no um, but I think that the thing that the the people in the no camp have in common <coughs> is they in my opinion correctly look at individual people being exposed to these IRA or internet research agency Russian troll accounts on social media and then at saying okay they've seen these accounts do their political opinions change and the answer is no but the people in the yes camp um, they say well I don't think that this is how this kind of stuff changes people's minds so what happens so what people in the yes camp say is you've got to take into account indirect and net network effects so disinformation can actually leak into the US media ecosystem and when these messages are being propagated by <coughs> Uh, you know, more trusted news websites, not these kind of spammy looking internet research agency accounts on Twitter, then um, the messages become a lot more credible. And I wanted to share with you this, this um, map here. So this is a map created by, you actually can't quite see the, the citation on the bottom, but this is, uh, was created by a group from Harvard. Um, Yokai Benkler, Rob Farris, and Hal Roberts led this. And they collected a huge amount of data about uh, subs uh, people who visit, so individual people who visit various US uh, media websites. And they built up this incredible network, which is the US media ecosystem during 2016. Um, and the size of the circle, the size of the node in this network represents how popular that news outlet was during 2016. And one of the most interesting things about this map is that if you see on the, the, the right side of the, of the map, you see that the largest red circle is Breitbart News. And Breitbart News became incredibly popular during this period. And according to this data, uh, their popularity even uh, dwarfed that of Fox News. And so Breitbart News is a and it's is known that they were pushing some of the same messages uh, that the, the Russian trolls were pushing on social media. So this, we think, is an example of those messages leaking into the US media ecosystem. So a couple of things to look out for in uh, 2020 is, so look at what um, uh, US publishers are publishing, what decisions are they making, and Maybe rather than looking at the, this is a very hard thing to do, which I think we, but one thing we should be looking at is tracking messages in the, um, in the media ecosystem and seeing whether messages that originate with social media trolls are then being published by um, nodes in the US media ecosystem. <coughs> and so I think the last thing I want to talk about on uh, b before I sit down is this other new thing about um, this current period of disinformation that we're in which uh, which surprised me and I think is very interesting so so Jennifer Kavanagh and Michael Rich from the Rand Corporation did this very detailed historical study of uh, what they call truth decay so they highlighted all of these past periods of uh, where disinformation was kind of uh, rife in in American society and they say that one th so we may have disagreed about norms and values in the past but that we haven't qu had to quite the same extent this disagreement about facts you know everyone kind of accepted that facts existed and that um, n we didn't have this phenomenon where people say it's possible to have your own facts we don't we don't share facts um, and this, unsurprisingly, is going hand in hand with a growing distrust in the truth-telling institutions in the United States. So you can see this across a, a wide variety of, of data sets that, in fact, I see it in my friends on, on social media, funnily enough, that there's just this growing distrust in um, truth-telling institutions like media, government, and the civil service. And again, you can see this in the data. We've measured this in data. And this is not a benign development. So in a paper that my colleagues and I published in Nature Human Behavior uh, in December 2019, we, we showed that this is a study that's based on 109 countries, by the way. So 
these countries, this is a wide array of countries that we included in this study. And what we found was that when you have this declining trust in institutions, um, uh, you get political instability increases and transitions away from democracy can occur. And um, there's no reason to think why this can't happen in the United States or the UK or Australia or, or, f or France. Um, so I think, I'll, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. That's a really good uh, setup about disinformation. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Harmon. Uh, I'm a political beast. I study political communication. I've been a politician. Hell, I'm always a politician. <laughs> but I, I'm here to scare you. I'm here to scare you about what's been happening out there with social media. Some stuff that has broken. Almost all the things I'm going to quote to you have broken in the past three to four months. Some of them in the past three to four days. And I want to share with you some of the stuff that's going on and where disinformation is particularly blossoming and becoming quite dangerous, especially in this election year. Okay? So that's my goal. And I'm going to start in a weird place with uh, craft videos. Craft videos? You mean like needlepoint and stuff like that? Yeah, stuff like that. Let's start with the soul publishing. You might not know the soul publishing, but it has the third largest reach, at least it did last November, of any of the entertainment uh, channels on YouTube. Only Disney and Warner Media reach more people than the soul. And while the soul might look like the innocuous purveyor of craft videos, it also bizarrely had up on its site a whole bunch of pro-Russia histories including one that, get, that uh, put effusive praise on the mass murderer Joseph Stalin. So what the heck was going on with the soul? Well, Lisa Kaplan of Lawfare in December published an intriguing and scary article. She found that the soul is run by Russian nationals. It is managed from Cyprus, where Russians love to do their banking. Its ad revenues from YouTube and Google are worth tens of millions of dollars. Oh, and also occasionally to promote itself and its videos, uh, buys ads, of course, in other places. It won 2018 a purchase of ads on Facebook, um, talking to US, targeting U.S. citizens on political issues, of course. Uh, they made that purchase in rubles. Okay? So now the soul says it is suspending its histories. Keep an eye on them. Make sure they have. You want to know another weird place where things have been happening? The Epic Times, you may not have heard of that, but that's a Chinese-American offshoot of the Falun Gong movement, okay? It's pro-Trump and anti-Chinese government. Now, you can be either or both of those things, but it is so bad with uh, distributing misinformation and disinformation that it got banned from buying ads on Facebook. You realize how lenient Facebook has been about buying ads? This group was bad enough to get banned from there. Um, National Public Radio and Snopes.com, I must give credit to both of them, they looked into Epic Times and found out that it's connected to something else called the BL, Beauty of Life. Uh, that's a very popular site. And when they looked further, they found that uh, Facebook has now shut down 900 fake accounts, many with artificial intelligence profile, generated profiles, all associated with this suspect Epic Times and BL groups. NPR also in late last year looked at I Instagram and in a moment we're going to hear about how viral video memes are harder to trace as forms of disinformation and they may be the biggest 2020 battlefield between truth and crazy made-up falsehoods. Okay, But uh, Facebook shut down 50 Instagram accounts Instagram accounts, excuse me, linked to a Russian influence campaign from the Kremlin Link Troll Factory that we mentioned earlier, the Internet Research Agency. But here's the scariest part of all. The Internet Research Agency, of course, helped the Trump campaign dramatically in 2016, and everybody but this administration seems to be accepting that fact. 
Okay. But now the Trump campaign says, you know what? Maybe we don't need to rely so much on the Russians. Maybe we can do so much of the self ourselves. And that's the scariest article of all. It comes from McKay Coppins in The Atlantic just eight days ago. Here's what he found. Autocratic and authoritarian leaders around the world no longer need to shut down the dissidents who are shouting in the streets. They can use a social media megaphone to drown them out. Call it censorship through noise. And that's what's happening. Duterte in the Philippines is excellent at it. Erdogan in Turkey, others as well. Here's the headline out of the McKay Coppins piece. The Trump campaign is planning to spend $1 billion, that's billion with a B, $1 billion on what it calls its own, on a massive disinformation campaign that has adopted and adapted the Russia, what the Russians did in 2016. Brad Pascal, I don't know if any of you have seen Brad Pascal. He's, he's, he's sort of got a shaved head and a beard, and he looks like uh, somebody who escaped ZZ Top. But he is a serious man with serious abilities, and he knows the Internet. He has created in the suburbs of Virginia something that he himself calls the Death Star for micro-targeting that began with Cambridge Analytica and, improved, and he's expanded through psychographic information. Psychographic, as you know, is beliefs and attitudes, not just demographics. And those are powerful motivators and things in our lives. During impeachment, as the Death Star was being checked out, Trump ran 14,000 different ads on social media that in some way or another included the word impeachment. Some of what the Trump campaign has done, but we know they know how to use this platform. From June to November 2016, the Trump campaign ran 5.9 million ads on Facebook. Hillary Clinton's campaign, just 66,000. They knew this medium. Here's what they have ready for 2020. They have nearly 30,000, excuse me, 3,000 data points on every voter. 3,000 things about voters. Okay, so it's not just what primaries you voted in, male, female, your age. They know things like uh, whether there's likely pets in the household. Uh, how do you, do you golf frequently? Um, what it may be some religious affiliations. And they pick this up by merging data sets, big data the way you talked about. What are they also planning to do with all that information, all that big data? Well, they have a separate little data file uh, for journalists who dare to report unflattering things. And they're promising swarms of surrogates to personally attack journalists who say anything bad about Trump or his campaign. I look forward to the attacks on me because I'm going to be raising hell about this. Attacking journalists. It's bad enough to call freedom of the press and our, our active press the enemy of the people, but to attack them as such during an election year to a partisan benefit. Didn't somebody just get impeached for something like that? All right. Um, now, in addition to that, the Trump campaign, according to Micaiah Coppin's article, is uh, investing in a texting platform that could send anonymous messages to millions of voters' phones. Now, there are some FCC's rules about this, but they get around it by sort of bouncing it through supporters' phones without even the supporters' knowledge. It is an amazing thing that you're going to be getting text messages like you wouldn't believe. And the Trump campaign, through Brad Parscale and all the ideas he stole from the Russians, is, are creating real-sounding websites with innocuous names like Arizona Monitor and Kalamazoo Times. And their idea here is to steal from the credibility of local TV news. Fool a local TV news operation into doing a story. You get their credibility, and they tend to be more credible than national newscasts with most people. And bang, your local friendly newscasters become conduits for their disinformation. So these are the things they are planning. I wish I could tell you I had a solution or a remedy, okay? I can tell you that there are wonderful places where you can and should check things to not become part of the problem. Factcheck.org, flackcheck.org, which looks at ads, Snopes.com, which used to be Urban Legends but does political stuff now too, the Washington Post Fact Checker, which if you haven't noticed, the Trump camp, uh, Donald Trump now has exceeded 16,000 lies in office. It's going to crash the 17,000 barrier probably by the end of the month. Okay? 
Uh, PolitiFact, which is now run by the Pointer Institute, won a Pulitzer Prize, excellent fact-checking organization. Even on images, I mean, uh, you can probably have better stuff on images, but start with images.google.com, spot some obvious fakes. How relevant, how, how easy is it for something to get into our political mainstream that is pure made-up nonsense? Give you an example from yesterday. The Daily Mail, you're from the UK, you know the Daily Mail, it's a tabloid. It's not to be trusted. Okay, well, I'm glad they, I hope they got that right. Yeah, but they ran a fringe theory that coronavirus may, may have come from a Chinese biosafety land, lab in Wuhan. Uh, there's nothing to support that. The scientific evidence suggests this is a, a common variation on a virus that occurred in bats and through this market got into people. Okay? But from there, with the Daily Times article, the Washington Times. People familiar with the Washington Times? It's the radical right paper in Washington that is run by the Unification Church, the Moonies. People do not often know that. That's where it started. That's the radical right group. So that got in the Washington Times. Of course, that paper is read by radical right politicians like Senator Tom Cotton, who suggested in a Sunday program on Fox that, uh, that the same thing, that this could be a Chinese, well, maybe not a plot, but maybe a screw up at a lab. And he cha and he was challenged by the Chinese ambassador. He said, it's up to you to prove it's not true, <laughs> which is one of the weirdest things you ever heard, but then it's Tom Cotton. Um, so, and of course, from there, it got on to, to Fox News, and then from there, it went to your uncle, and from there, it got to you, right? Okay, that's how those things work. So let me leave a lot of time for discussion, but I want to leave with you this thing. This scary stuff that I'm telling you about only as a portent of the things to come. Social media has wonderful aspects, but if you're not using it properly and you're not fact-checking, you're going to get screwed by people who know to you how to use it better than you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get this computer set back up. Do you know which one? Let's see. Ah. Let's see. Fabulous. All right. How y'all doing this morning? Woohoo! Yes. All right. Um, so thank you, Catherine. Thank you this, to the uh, College of Communication and Information for having me. Um, and thank you to my fellow panelists for their wonderful talk so far. Um, I'm Dr. Jessica Maddox. I'm coming to you all today from the University of Alabama. But don't boo me for that. My PhD is from the University of Georgia. Boo. So y'all can choose how you want to boo me off the stage later through my affiliation. But I'm very happy to be here in Knoxville today um, to talk to with you guys about some of my research um, on deep fakes and photo manipulation online. Um, my fellow panelists have excellently talked about the ways uh, organized campaigns work on misinformation and the way these things can be targeted and deliberate, but I want to switch the focus just for one second and talk about us. I want to talk about you, I want to talk about me, I want to talk about our friends, and I want to talk about our family. Because some of the most common ways misinformation gets shared online is through one of the ways we use social media the most, and that is through the visual, okay? So how many of y'all have heard the phrase, the camera doesn't lie? Right? We're all pretty familiar with this one. But we've also heard phrases like, the camera adds 10 pounds. That's a lie. It does not. It does not. You all look fabulous in front of cameras. So we have to reconcile these statements and the things we know to be true about photography. For so often, we, we so often take photography as truth. As there's a picture of it, it has to be real. The camera doesn't lie. But cameras and photos and videos lie all the time. This isn't necessarily malicious. These people aren't necessarily doing it on purpose. Um, back at Alabama, I teach a class on media technology, um, and I teach my students all the time that to frame is to exclude, right? Whenever you take a photo, you're choosing what to include in that photo, what not to include in that photo. Um, and that's just how photography works. We can't take a picture of the whole world, right? So we're always making choices about what our pictures should be and, and what they shouldn't. And so it's not done maliciously. Even when we share photos and take them out of initial context, which I'll talk more about in a second, oftentimes this isn't malicious. 
It's in service of sharing something funny. It's in service of sharing a story we find fascinating. Um, but this also poses a lot of problems on social media. Okay. Some of the most often ways misinformation of the visual gets spread online is simply by taking photos out of their original context and repurposing them in new ones, okay? So, and that's not often political, which is why I included um, this photo up here of what looks like a Handmaid's Tale wedding. <laughs> um, this was not a Handmaid's Tale wedding. This couple got married in Canada um, at the convention center that houses um, the wall, the infamous hanging wall from the television show The Handmaid's Tale. If you're familiar, if you're not, this is where in the um, fascist dystopia individuals were uh, hung in front of the wall to be made an example of in front of the whole uh, dystopia. But so this couple, they were fans of the show. They knew that the convention center they got married on housed this wall. They took this photo of themselves kissing um, in front of the wall and then kind of as a gag, they're um, with their approval, their editor put the photos of the handmaids in. So this then got spread across social media as, oh my God, who on earth would have a Handmaid's Tale themed wedding? These people did not have a Handmaid's Tale themed wedding. <laughs> um, they simply took advantage of fandom in front of this wall. You know, we can think about whatever we want to with that, but it goes to show that when we simply take a photo out of its original context, edit the caption, put it in a new caption, um, put it on another social media site, we can completely change a narrative and make up a story about a Handmaid's Tale wedding. Now, I think the Kardashians actually did have like a Handmaid's Tale birthday party, so we can judge them for that, but these people did not have a Handmaid's Tale wedding. But another example here, um, this was an Instagram photo of Australian actress um, Samara, uh, Samara Weaver, Samara Weaving, forgive me, I can't remember their, um, her full name, but this was makeup she posted to her Instagram um, on the set of a show she was shooting. This photo then got taken from her Instagram um, and put on Facebook with the caption, the result of fascism in America, simply because she was a Trump supporter. All right, so this was not the original narrative. This is not the photo at all, and instead got completely repurposed um, into a new context. So the original image was removed from its original context, repurposed in a new one, and told a whole new story. Now, we see this one way of being simply, you know, taking photo, put it in a new context, but we also have Photoshop, right? This is probably the most common way when I said I was going to talk about visual misinformation, probably talking about Photoshop, and that is something as well. All right, so here's a photo of Adam Schiff with Jeffrey Epstein. This is not a setup for an Epstein didn't kill himself joke, so get your mind out of the gutter. Um, this is not actually a photo of Adam Schiff and Jeffrey Epstein. We can tell if we look at it, um, one, the lighting reflecting on their faces is completely different. Um, one has harsher lighting on his face, one has another. You can also see that the skin color of Epstein's face doesn't match his hands. And that is because this is a photoshopped photo, and yes, that is also a sex toy somebody photoshopped into the background. And here's the original. Um, this is a, shift, a photo Adam Schiff took with his um, father on Thanksgiving that then someone photoshopped Epstein's face into and the sex toy into as well. Um, and this also got spread. This uh, edited photo of Schiff and Epstein had over, I think, to believe 10,000 shares on Instagram, um, despite being completely photoshopped. But it's... Visual misinformation is not a partisan issue. It's a bipartisan one. Photographic theorist uh, Susan Sontag back in the 1970s wrote that individuals are more likely to discount and discredit photos as fake if it disagrees with their political ideologies. And this is now almost 50 years before what we have today. Another example um, of how this is a bipartisan issue um, so this gentleman, gentleman Reichard, um, found a photo of himself where the FXB hat you see on the bottom was edited to be a Trump 2020 hat. Um, so he tweeted, woke up this morning to know I'm the new face for the 2020 Trump campaign, and he was confused about it. But then this took off as well. Everybody immediately blamed the Trump campaign and said, can you believe it? They're Photoshopping their logos. Um, 
onto um, black American individuals to try to bolster support. Nope, this is, this is also debunked. Um, this Trump campaign had nothing to do with this. Um, once again, Snopes.com is a great uh, resource for some of these examples and it shows you how in fact they had nothing to do with it as well. But while we can manipulate photos and photo manipulation is something we're really used to with Photoshop and things like that, what's scarier is video manipulation. Because while we knew photos can be Photoshopped, they can be edited in filters, it used to be a lot harder to fake video until recently. So I'm sure you all have heard about deep fake technology or deep fakes. Um, these are machine learning, um, artificial intelligence programs that when given information can completely replicate somebody else's identity, face, voice, etc. So you can see in these two examples up here, um, you see on your far left an original video of Barack Obama um, imp inputted into one of these machine learning deep fake programs and on the next to it, something that looks pretty darn close to Barack Obama. Right? I can't spot, my untrained eye can't spot a difference. Over here as well, we see a woman, uh, this original photo of a woman in the yellow cardigan. Um, the woman, they wanted to manipulate her face, so they put her in. So that one looks a little different. We can see the um, that woman in the little insert picture. We can see her likeness. Um, but that's how easy it is now. There are apps that do this that you can download to your smartphone and make a deep fake today if you wanted to. Um, there's an Amsterdam-based uh, research agency that has estimated deepfakes have increased over 800% online in the last three years, um, which is a staggering number. But the thing I also want to mention about deepfakes today is we should be very cautious on how we approach them and very cautious about the panic we have about them. We should be afraid of them. This is scary. Videos are a lot harder to manipulate. They're a lot harder to assess truth versus fiction from. But deepfake technology is not new. Anybody seen Forrest Gump? What about the most recent Star Wars movies? Deepfake technology was used in all of those movies to insert Tom Hanks into historical scenes, uh, the late Carrie Fisher into scenes in those late Star Wars movies. So we have had this technology for a long time. So once again, we should never fear technology itself, uh, but we should fear how they're used and the ends that they're used for. And to that end, um, there has been a lot of regulation um, that it, regulation discussions that have happened regarding deepfakes. California is the first state in the country to pass a law uh, banning deepfakes. Uh, most of you all are journalism students, so this should probably be of interest to you because they had to make very large provisions in the law for satire, parody, and free speech. Right. So where does when does a deepfake become? malicious, and when is it simply free speech? Um, this is what critics of California's law say the law doesn't go far enough, but once again, we have to consider those First Amendment protections as well. So what can you do? I always advocate um, a healthy dose of skepticism, and skepticism does not mean cynicism, right? So you may be thinking, God, can I not trust a single picture or video I see online ever again? It's complicated. Um, and while you may think, wow, that's really cynical, just question it. You know, we're so, we live in such a politically charged time that when you see, uh, you know, a photo of Adam Schiff with Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein, you'll be like, I knew it. I knew he was up to no good. Well, just take a second. Like Susan Sontag said, we're more likely to discount images that disagree with our own views and agree with ones that do. So it's not a partisan issue. This is something we can all do to be better uh, consumers of social media. Also, if you're interested, talk to your local legislators, um, and you can also put pressure on social media platforms because change really does only happen when um, we put pressure on them and ask them to be transparent about what they're doing. So this is a pretty good place for me to wrap up, and I'm happy to take any questions in Q&A. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, now that we're all in a great mood. Uh, my name is Brandon Hollingsworth. As mentioned a little earlier in this discussion, I'm the news director at WUOT, which is the public radio station, the NPR station downstairs here at uh, the university. 
and I've been in that role for a couple of years, and my job is not to uh, pontificate or tell you what's on my mind, but to help guide a discussion with our panelists based on what they just talked about and to solicit questions from all of you as well. Our out time is 10.55. It's now coming up on 10.20, so we have about a good about uh, 30 minutes, just about, or 35 minutes left to, uh, to have more of a freewheeling kind of discussion here. Where I wanted to begin with each of our panelists is when we talk about, for instance, what happened in 2016, and it's been very popular in the years since then, four years now, to point a finger at social media and say, well, Twitter and Facebook, and that's what caused this, or that was a major factor in this. I believe, Damien, it was you were saying, um, and forgive me if I got the, the attribution wrong, but uh, studies have indicated it doesn't really change people's minds all that much. It's not like somebody who had one particular point of view saw a tweet and that completely shifted them into a different direction. So I wanted to ask, how much blame does social media legitimately get? I mean, if we're really being fair and accurate about this kind of thing, uh, how much do we say, well, it has this much of the, of the pie chart? in terms of people's political opinions uh, versus, you know, like 90% of the blame goes to social media. What does it look like realistically? Well, I think... Oh, sorry, let me do that. Oh, of course. Well, the thing, ultimately, it's, it's a neutral thing, right? It's just a communication tool. It's just a new communication tool that we haven't really figured out how to use properly yet. Um, and so you're quite right when you say that um, there's been plenty of, uh, plenty of studies now that show that when individuals look at, um, say, internet research agency accounts on social media, their, their opinions, their political opinions don't, don't measurably change. There was a really great paper in PNAS just a month ago that, that actually demonstrate this in a really cool way. But the problem is, is when um, these, like I said in my talk, when these messages uh, get into the, 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 the actual US media ecosystem, so when they're re when these messages are reprinted by, you know, Fox News or Breitbart News or, or MSNBC or, or, or any or, or any any news company, um, because then they have credibility, and that is when um, they, they they can affect um, what people think. In my opinion. Let me see if I can actually. This, this is, oh hey, look at this. We don't have to share mics. This is yeah, great. Mics, and my, uh, Mark, did you have something to add on to that? I would add that yeah. Uh, but the effect might be, you know, even with a heavily targeted social media thing, but if it depresses turnout half a percentage point, or if it, you know, switches a, a thousand minds in Pennsylvania and, and also depresses turnout, that can be enough in the, uh, in the time of the Electoral College to flip an important state. So on a presidential level, the Electoral College multiplies the effect uh, because, let's face it, you know, some, there are going to be some very close states in 2016. There, were, there are going to be some close states this time around. And if you, because I think the major effect tends to be not changing ideas, but changing turnout. Hmm. And if, if you can motivate a whole bunch of your supporters to get up and vote, if, or a whole bunch of frustrated people who were going to vote for the other side to just express their frustration either by not voting or supporting a third-party candidate. It flips a state. It can flip an election. I think it did. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, continue on, on that thread with either or Mark or somebody else who could comment on this. Do we also see this uh, trickling down to state-level, congressional-level, local-level races? I mean, we talk a lot about the presidential election, but obviously in this country we vote for a lot of offices. Is, is there concern about this uh, at, at less than the national level or lower than the national level? I think the, it gets really s – the concern and the abuse gets smaller the, the, the more you go down toward the county commission, city council, school mm -hmm. board level. It's not that it can't happen there. It's not that there haven't been social media scandals there. Uh, there are fewer. Uh, I think most local candidates leg are legitimately using social media for, for noble and usual campaign practices like organizing volunteers, getting messages out, and fundraising. Uh, but um, could it, you know, if it gets successful on a presidential, will it become a senatorial and gubernatorial tool? Will it work its way down to state house races? Yeah, it will. 
I want to direct this next question, I think, to, to Jessica and then maybe get all three of you to comment. We'll just work back toward me about mm -hmm. uh, the role of media literacy or journalism yeah. literacy in this. And what I encounter as a journalist, mm -hmm. I'm not sure my family knows what I do for a living, <laughs> you know, and they've known me for my entire life. Mm -hmm. But they live in Alabama, by the way. Hey. So I'm from, <laughs> from Alabama. And... Um, you know, so they don't listen to what I do mm -hmm. up here in, in Tennessee, and they, they're mm -hmm. not really engaged with, with that part of my life. So when, to use them perhaps as an example, and maybe we all know people who are like this, if you don't know the difference between legitimate journalism and something that just kind of looks like it, like mm -hmm. a mock-up yeah. that looks legitimate and has a legitimate-looking mm -hmm. URL and has a photo and an article, and mm -hmm. boy, that looks like I would see on a news website, mm -hmm. um, would it help if we were just talking more or teaching people better about what where journalism comes from you know mm -hmm. so that you're knowing the difference between the boxes of cereal on the cereal <laughs> aisle and, and not thinking they're all exactly the same thing absolutely I think media literacy is hugely important I mean in general and particularly in this moment that we're in um, some previous work I've done in the past has looked at the spread of fake news news that isn't necessarily um, you know, turned out by the IRA or the Internet Research Agency, but people simply not reading an article, sharing it with the caption being like, this is what this story is about. And then it spreads through our social media ecosystem that way with people not even actually reading the article, but taking somebody else's maybe incorrect summary of it and, and spreading it on. So if it sounds like a game of telephone, it is. And so oftentimes... Um, when I look at misinformation and, and uh, individuals, I am particularly interested in the individual user, what we do, and how we can be better. So I think media literacy is hugely important. Like I said, I advocate a healthy dose of skepticism always, and also with what you read. You know, y you all are, are journalists, assess the source, encourage your families to assess the source. Um, and I think that's a huge, a, a huge part of attempting to fix this problem. And Mark, you have a foot in both of these because you're a columnist, but you also study political communication. What do you think about this? Well, uh, first, a total agreement on media literacy, so important. I had a student recently quote to me, seriously, The Onion. Uh, the, Onion the, the Onion, for those of you who don't know, is a comic website. By the way, not the only person. Like, political officials have political cited officials The Onion unknowingly, the, the, thinking the, it was a real thing. The North Korean government has accidentally cited The Onion. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would... I would echo that. We try to teach that in our classes. I don't know if we do a good enough job, but we certainly try to make people aware of those things. Uh, media literacy um, also is harmed by the fact that we have less genuine gut-level reporting going on. You know, we're seeing a decline in the number of journalists, a decline in the number of daily newspapers, a decline in the number of people who routinely cover city councils, county commissions, etc., and it's inevitable that, you know, they're finding these cheap, good news organizations are finding cheap and easy ways to, to get information. Now, our panel this afternoon will actually get into whether you should use social media as a news source or how you should use social media as a news source. But when you rely on that, when you rely on cheap viewer-submitted stuff, occasionally viewer-submitted stuff is wrong. Yeah, yeah. I'd just like to add something. Absolutely. So, um, so media literacy is always right at the top of lists of public policy solutions to this problem of disinformation on social media, and, and rightly so, I mean, I, I agree. But the, the, the problem we have with uh, media literacy, and this speaks to what uh, Jess was saying in her talk, is that the way we tend to teach media literacy, you know, is at schools, right? We, we, you know, you gotta get them whilst they're young, you know, teach, teach kids when they're young how to uh, absorb news on social media, how to be skeptical about what they see on, on social media. The problem is, is that the landscape is changing so rapidly. I mean, so at the last election, you know, the, all the stuff that I've been working on, well, I've been looking at how to, you know, extract messages from text and looking at the diffusion of messages made of text. But as, as Jess pointed out, increasingly, you know, now it's like pictures and deep fakes and, and who knows what, you know, we're going to be worried about in 10, 20 years. I mean, the, there's just the ex this acceleration of te technological change means that any advice we give now it's likely to be completely out of date in like 10, 10, 20 years. Yeah, so our understanding of this, the building the better mousetrap also has to evolve very rapidly, yeah. as it can, I guess. Yeah. And that, and that's, I guess yeah. I just don't have that much faith in our mm -hmm. collective ability to, to learn all of these the skills required to navigate this landscape. Well, this is why I'm glad we have an anthropologist on the panel, because something that I was wondering about a little earlier uh, that I know I don't have the knowledge base to, to answer, um, 
I read a book several years ago about the Apollo astronauts when they came back from the moon. There's this kind of common canard that's deployed that something so profound must have changed them. And so they always get asked in interviews, how did going to the moon change you? And the conclusion of this author, who actually did interview the, the surviving Apollo astronauts, his conclusion was it didn't change them. It just made them more of who they were. Characteristics that were present in those people before they went to the moon were just, they were still there. Neil Armstrong was always a quiet guy. He got even more so when he came back. Buzz Aldrin was always an, uh, an attention seeker, and he became more so when he got back. We just became, or they just became more of who they already were. Um, Brooke Gladstone, who's a media commentator who works for public radio and hosts a program called On the Media, wrote an e-book about three years ago that came to a similar conclusion about all of us, which is that social media didn't so much change us as it did emphasize who we already were to begin with. That sort of dovetails on what you were talking about, about social opinions. I want to delve a little bit more into that. Is that just generally true, that social media didn't necessarily change who we were? It just sort of allowed us to drop the mask. It made us more of who we already were to begin with, whether that's along partisan lines or not. Um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm, I'm now probably exposing that I'm actually a fake anthropologist. My yeah, God. I'm just in the anthropology department. He's a deep fake anthropologist, yeah. folks. <laughs> You're seeing it right now. Um, <laughs> but funnily enough, we were talking about something similar at, our, at a journal yeah. club that we have um, every second Monday, which everyone can come to. Um, so w we asked the question, so when, so we're talking about targeted marketing and how, you know, and why are people targeted, you know, are, are social media companies trying to, or advertisers actually trying to change people's minds? Um, it doesn't really look that way to me. I think it's more that, like you say, people are who they are. What, what they're looking for are cues in the way you're already behaving. And they go, okay, this is who you are, therefore I'm gonna target this at you. So I, I think that kind of speaks to what, to what you were yeah, saying. Yeah. Does that make it harder for us to be skeptical? Because then we're going to, by this, by this uh, um, premise that you're introducing into the conversation here, we're going to then be getting targeted advertising that is likely to either enrage us and get us to do something or please us and get us to do something already. So is it going to be harder to be skeptical, uh, to apply the skepticism that I think Jessica rightly said needs to be applied when they're kind of trying to get around our own internal barriers on that matter? Yeah. Um, do one of you guys want to take that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is definitely hard to be skeptical. And even though I advocate for this healthy dose of skepticism in approaching images and videos online, it's hard. We, we see things, we're like, yeah, I totally, I knew that. I totally knew Adam Schiff was up to something. I totally knew the Trump campaign would Photoshop their logo. Because it, like Brandon was saying, it reinforces what we think we already know. It reinforces what we believe about the world. And this does get into um, some issues with things like filter bubbles and echo chambers on social media where we only follow accounts and news or organizations and pundits that agree with us. So we create these little bubbles for ourselves where it's kind of just a constant reaffirming feedback loop of what we think we know about the world. Um, so I think the first step in trying to break out of that skepticism is as much as it might pain you, maybe step out of your comfort zone and follow a pundit that isn't sprouting nonsense, but maybe doesn't necessarily agree with you. Um, because it's going to still, you know, be smart about it. Don't follow somebody, like I said, who's sprouting obvious fake news about coronavirus being a, a Chinese plot at a lab. But break out of your filter bubble, follow somebody that doesn't necessarily agree with your positions and who's advocating them smart, uh, smartly. And I think that's, can, that can help. Yeah, I, I would second that notion wholeheartedly. I mean, when I'm sitting around and I'm watching, say, MSNBC, Becky, my wife, nudges me and says, check and see what Fox is doing. Yeah. Just so I'm seeing what the other side is talking about. I may disagree. I may throw a pillow at the screen. But you know what? It's better that I know what they're saying. Okay? And I, I, I love some columnists who I would in previous years would have horribly disagreed with. Uh, Jennifer Rubin at the Washington Post is fantastic. Uh, she, she's a conservative Republican. I'm a liberal Democrat. But damn, she writes well yeah. and argues well. And I rethink my position every time I read her stuff. 
And you've got to be that open-minded, okay? You see, what happens is that cynicism is a shortcut, so you get over the cognitive dissonance of skepticism. You say, oh, all media lie, or all, well, that's a big whopping generalization and false. Uh, and I'm a recovering politician, and I'm not really recovered. Uh, but, I mean, I, you know, you'll say all politicians are corrupt, they're all bought and paid for. I, I've worked with politicians. I, you know, I was a politician. I know politicians. That's not true. Too many can be rented, but not all are bought and paid for. And those subtle distinctions, and that is a subtle distinction, is meritorious to you to know and understand. And I realize that requires more work than you want to put into that argument. Tough. Do it. Well, thank you, Mark, <laughs> for that. Um, as we talked about, uh, actually, we have not talked a whole lot about this specifically, but I'd like to inject that into our conversation at this point. Um, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube have all been struggling to come up with acceptable, practical, and legal ways to, to quote-unquote, do their part to try to tamp down on this so that they're not maybe being as taken advantage of or, or not being as much of a carrier of these particular uh, viruses and germs that are making their way across the internet without crossing the line into censorship and of course for them not hurting their bottom line too much because that's always their concern. But because it is so simple, we have talked about how simple it is now to misinform, how the technology is this there to create fake videos, fake articles that look like the real thing. Uh, and it can be done by any actor in any part of the world with the know-how and the technology to do so, is it simply too late to, to stop? Are we aiming for the wrong target when we say we need to stop misinformation and instead what we need to do is just tell people that it's there and look out for it? Is it just too late to, for the concept of this can be done away with, we can't put that genie back in the bottle? Um, I think it's kind of too early to say. I mean, so this is a, you know, this is a really new thing, you know, so you know, when I was a teenager, that wasn't even Facebook, right? It wasn't even a, a thing. Um, and, yeah, and like you said, the, the ins so, you know, th these companies have to think about fir the First Amendment. They have to think about the right to free speech, you know, which you could argue is kind of convenient because that permits them to allow, you know, political advertising, which is very profitable for, for these companies. A and, and that point has been raised. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so, but Twitter made what I thought was quite a brave decision, right? They said, okay, this is, we're just not having political advertising on our platform. Um, you know, and that's a brave choice because that, you know, because they're a private company and they need to think about their bottom line, right? That's one of the things they have to think about. And they've no doubt they'll take a hit uh, because of that. Um, I just think that we, we need to figure this out through events like this. You know, we all need to discuss it and figure it out, like what is acceptable on social media. You know? Also understand what the First Amendment is and isn't. It doesn't apply to a private corporation. Facebook can choose to not carry any political ads or can choose to reject ads that it considers untruthful. Uh, Twitter chose the brave course of saying, no, political ads, fine. I think it's like you, I think it's a brave, good choice. Facebook, on the other hand, Mm, they see a lot of money in it. And they're, they're trying this. I don't know if you noticed this, but they've sort of tried this outsourcing technique. They've asked Reuters to look through their stuff for deep fakes. <laughs> Reuters, by the way, is a wire service. A British um, uh, wire yeah, service. British wire service, and so they're, they're a group of journalists. And they're asking uh, Pointer and other institutions to occasionally point out anything that is a really bad political ad. But they haven't taken the, the, the bold steps. But when they claim a First Amendment thing, no. Okay, First Amendment deals with government actions. These private companies can choose to make better policies. They can choose to make work worse policies. But don't let them hide behind the First Amendment totally on this. Yeah, excellent points made by my fellow panelists here. And I, I want to bring up something we haven't talked about yet, which is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, this was a law passed in the 1990s by the U.S. Congress um, that set, it's basically uh, protects internet uh, platforms from the content that is shared on their sites. So similar to how the US Postal Service cannot be held responsible for what you mail or how your phone provider cannot be held responsible for what you say on the phone, Section 230 allows Facebook and Twitter and YouTube to be protected from the content we as users share on their sites. So I do not think 
we should not get rid of Section 230. It does a lot more good than it does harm. However, I agree with um, legal theorists Danielle Citron and Benjamin Witz, um, who have their excellent paper is simply titled, The Internet Will Not Break, Denying Bad Samaritans Section 230 um, Protections, or what are also called Safe Harbor Provisions. Um, so we need to look at this and understand that there is a relationship between platforms and the content shared on their site, even if they are not the creators of the content we are sharing on their sites. Um, that they do, that platforms do have a responsibility, um, even if they would like to pretend that they don't, um, for what people are doing and what people are saying. So I do think there need, in, there has been some conversation among about this in um, the Democratic primary. It hasn't been a ton, and I would like to see more about what we should do with Section 230 and these platforms. Um, that maybe it's time to rethink that um, and how we. Uh, and how platforms are kind of get a hide behind the curtain. Um, but that is also along with the First Amendment is something we have to grapple with in the United States um, about platforms and misinformation. We have about 15 minutes left before we break uh, this session. And I wanted to turn to all of you because no matter how much I may prepare my list of questions, I can't anticipate what might be on your mind. So questions for our panelists that relate to uh, social media, targeted advertising, anything that we've talked about. We already have one in the back, and I will hand the mic over here. Mm -hmm. If I, I'm so sorry. Let me get through here. Yes. Um, Mark, I'm so glad you brought up critical media literacy. And I think one of the things that we can't overlook is the role of algorithms. And so, you know, you encourage students to get outside their comfort level, their comfort zone, and their filter bubble. But everything we see in our news feed is controlled by an algorithm. Um, if you look at your number of friends, there's no way you can see every, everything everybody's posting in a day. And Facebook determines what you're going to see based on what you already believe and what you already like to relieve cognitive dissonance, to keep you on Facebook longer, to continue to extract information. So we can't overlook the understanding the business model of companies like Facebook and also the fact that a lot of what we see is totally out of our control and algorithmic driven. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if any of you have research or want to speak to that. Absolutely. What a great question and what a great topic to bring up. So thank you so much for that. We cannot discount algorithms in all of this as well. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize algorithms are not neutral at all. Um, they are designed with cultural biases, political biases, social biases in mind. Um, and we also do need to be wary of that when an algorithm may control what we see, but it does not control what we do with what we see. Um, so there has been a lot of research on YouTube um, as a radicalizing um, platform that it will push more and more extreme content um, towards viewers because part of YouTube's business model is they want to keep you on the site for as long as possible. So they push this more and more extreme content through their algorithm. But we know that one, you know, we've talked about how one best message, one video alone isn't enough to change someone's mind, but kind of reinforce what's already there. Um, so with algorithms, it is also important to look at personal identity, community, um, and how these, um, how people, what people choose to do with the content pushed to them through algorithms is just as important as the algorithm itself. I just add those algorithms are protected more than the gold at Fort Knox. Uh, you can't get to them. Okay, we can only study them from like the uh, the breadcrumbs and the little trails they leave behind to try to figure out what's going on with them. Uh, for various legal and economic reasons, those firms are never going to let that information out. They're more guarded than Trump's taxes. Sorry. I think that's a really, really good point. Um, so this is something that I discuss with my colleagues all the time because we're trying to predict, you know, uh, behavior on the internet, and you just. You don't know where the, the human behavior begins and where the algorithmic behavior ends, if you know what I mean. Um, and yeah, and what brought this uh, fact home to me is um, I, my colleague pointed out uh, the situation with Netflix, right? So who else gets incredibly annoyed when somebody else uses their Netflix account and then it stops recommending the things that you like? <laughs> you know? It's destroyed, destroyed. exactly. Yeah. It'll, yeah. Take, yeah. it'll take weeks to get it back. Yeah. yeah. All right, questions, and maybe from this side of the room. I feel like I've been turning this way to our panel. I don't, we're not ignoring the folks on this side of the room. Any, anybody? Oh, yes. 
So obviously you're talking about how you know the First Amendment only applies to you know government action, um, but since like Twitter and Facebook and these platforms are so huge, and I'm not, it's not necessarily like, protecting those who are paying for the advertising, but those who are who are just like just normal everyday citizens, how do we balance trying to you know crack down on the fake news and the misinformation while summarily like protecting the freedom of speech just for the average citizen because you know you ban them from all these sites then a very massive like form of communication has been like taken away from them Take that. Oh, sure. <laughs> what a great question thank you um yeah it's it's a complicated situation to tip to parse through um I think when it comes to platforms, because they are private businesses at the end of the day, they really only change things when we put pressure on them, when we as users, because at the end of the day, the user is a platform's most important asset. I mean, yeah, they get advertising revenue, but they only get the advertising revenue in dollars because they want access to you. So we've seen when pressure in, in the past, we have seen when people put pressure on platforms to change, sometimes it happens. Um, I'm thinking of, for instance, um, on Instagram, there was the whole hashtag free the nipple movement where people wanted to post their breastfeeding photos and Instagram initially censored them and said, that's graphic that you can't, we can't put that. And they're like, what are you talking about? It was also censoring um, trans men and trans women um, with, taking photos of their um, surgeries, um, their transition surgeries. So with the whole hashtag free the nipple movement actually changed Instagram's policy on what was allowed and what wasn't. So when we do, and this is a different type of cultural example, but when we do put pressure on platforms, um, we can see results because at the end of the day, the user is the platform's most important asset. The problem is that the amount of data we're dealing with are so massive that human intervention becomes almost an incidental part, doesn't it? I mean, take for example the poor town of Scunthorpe. B have you heard about this? Because the letters C-U-N-T appear in that sequence, it's having all sorts of internet censorship problems <laughs> <laughs> because of the, you know, that kind of thing. So we have to be aware of automatic programs that, you know, can there are questions of decency, but you, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, complaints? I mean, there are certain things that we can and should say, okay, uh, advocating uh, or showing uh, physical abuse in relationships, for example, or something like that. We can raise objections to it, but boy, you've raised an important question, drawing that line and how do you do it? In, and I would add, how do you do it in such an environment where there's so much stuff going on, just normal, everyday, editor-like human intervention only gets to a small portion of it. That is the great challenge before us, but I think we might be up to it. We've got some smart people around. I'm hoping you are one of them. <laughs> I had a quick question for our group. Do we have any, uh, by show of hands, I guess, first-time voters, people who are just now old enough to vote in, in the November general elections? We've got Yay. probably about a dozen or a little bit more than that, maybe a dozen and a half. Uh, I want to turn to maybe one of you, and does, do any of you first-time voters have any kind of questions or concerns about, since you'll be taking for the first time part in this very important political process later this year, or hopefully you plan to. Well, maybe, maybe this week, because of early voting. And uh, early yeah, early voting, by the way, if you're a Knox County voter, already underway for the March 3rd primary, in which several races will actually be determined because the only people running are in the primaries. So check that out, of course, and look at the sample ballots from the Knox County Election Commission. But uh, any, any first-time voters have any questions about this unique new environment that to you may be quite familiar because we've been dealing with it for the last four years, but to all of us oldsters, is like this is a new thing. And any, any feedback or any questions related to that? This is not a caffeinated crowd, <laughs> which is all right. Too. And, and go vote, definitely do so. Yeah, we always encourage that for sure. I wanted to ask, maybe I can, I can keep things moving here along by just asking a question about, uh, to, to build on, we've talked about this a little bit already, that for all of the times Mark Zuckerberg gets hauled in front of Congress and has to look apologetic and the, the changes that YouTube or Twitter have to make to their policies and all the hand-wringing, really the, the biggest part of this, or a, let me say a big part of the machinery, is something that the platforms can't control, and that's the human reaction to it. We talked a little bit about uh, algorithms 
I read just yesterday that Twitter's algorithm, when they abandoned the chronological news feed or timeline and went to the, here's the stuff you'll like most, actually what they mean is posts that get the greatest amount of engagement and therefore are usually the ones that usually cause the most anger and divisiveness. Those pop into your feed much more commonly. That wasn't the intent when Twitter changed its algorithm, but that has become what it is. Um, but that's the reaction is something that Twitter and Facebook and YouTube can't control. They can't control what you do about it. How, how do we have that kind of conversation in, in a pluralistic society in which, you know, you know, my truth is your absolute garbage and, you know, I don't know, I don't want to get angry about it or anything like that, but it's what I'm seeing. It's what I'm constantly exposed to, other than, I guess, just deleting Facebook off your phone. You know what I mean? How do you, how do you deal with it? So I know it's, it's, it's unfashionable to stick up for Facebook, but uh, I think um, it also speaks to your question. So, so what, what their plan is, like you said, they've got all these fact checkers from, from Reuters, and rather than censoring uh, ads or messages or accounts, they are attaching like health warnings. Yeah, there are labels now that, yeah. that indicate maybe opinion versus yeah. an article versus something that's spurious. Yeah, and I, and I, I think that, that was so, that's, I think that's quite a clever way of, of um, you know, not getting into censorship because you want to try and avoid censorship if you can. And, but it, 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 is infor it, it allows users to get that information about the veracity of a post or a story in a, in a faster way. Because one of the, the problems w with social media is just the speed at which we use social media. Yeah. So the average time that we look at a a post on Twitter, I think it's like two or three seconds. Yeah. And it's not long enough to assess whether the story you're looking at is true or not. But just having a tag that says probably not true is, is going to help in this kind of high speed environment of social media. Because I think slowing down how people use social media is going to be tough. It, it feels like what you're saying is that the companies are going to have to match the attention span as opposed to the other way around. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah precisely. Uh, let, me, let me tag a media literacy point to that. You know, off, how often you find yourself remembering a fact or, or, or bringing up in conversation something you saw, but you can't remember from whence you learned it, right? That's why when you encounter something right on Twitter or you counter something on Facebook or where, wherever, you got to say to yourself, okay, I need to put in the little few seconds more to look at where it came from. Yeah. And if it's not a trusted source, maybe actually do a little search to see if it comes up in trusted places. Something else that may be worth pointing out about that, I see this all the time. When I look at something on, interesting on Facebook is it'll be a link to a blog post, but the blog post is a summary of somebody else's work, and then down at the bottom it says, hat tip to the other blog. So you click on that, and they got it from another blog who got it from another blog who got it from the Library of Congress or, you know, or somewhere. It's, sometimes it actually takes quite a bit of digging to find the, the original source, yeah. There is actually some interesting research by two guys called um, David Rand and Gordon Pennycook. And th they just showed that if you just take a few extra seconds, a a f some extra time whilst looking at a social media post, people become much better at assessing whether the, the, s the message is true or false. Hmm. It r um, but that is, it, it proves to be effective when people actually take the time to do it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. right. It's just the, the way social media is, it just people just don't, don't. That's uh, what, the reason I ask that is like the, that sort of the premise is like, well, the, the more people are challenged, the more they dig in their heels, you know, and they, they don't want to be convinced. What you're saying is well, the, that the, may not be as strong a premise as we think. Um, so that is also true. So I think you're on pretty solid ground with that. Oh, that so as a journalist, I'm wrong both ways. True. <laughs> I'm used um, to that. So you're right both. So, 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 so I'm right is, both ways. Yeah. So these are kind of stories where people don't don't already have a commitment. Mm -hmm. So you, you're right. I mean, if uh, okay. So, so if you're more emotionally invested, you're probably going to dig in the heels. Yeah. But something you're a little more neutral about, you could say, yeah, okay, you know, I can change my mind yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah precisely. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, folks, five minutes left. Last chance. I feel like I'm running an auction up here, but <laughs> but really, really slowly because I can't talk quite that fast. Did you have a point, uh, oh, Jessica, no, that you wanted to? Oh, okay. Kind of All right. <laughs> there it is. Maria has a question. I do have one. So, All right. with mm -hmm. Instagram kind oh, of yeah. just leading the way in all sorts of areas, mm -hmm. not just politics, right. how, I mean, how is Instagram going to mm -hmm. play into this election this year? The is question it, is, yeah. how is Instagram going to play into the election this year? Ooh, yeah. Be a bigger, you know, I talk so loud, everybody could 
Okay, right? I just because I don't know. We have we have people on on the internet yeah, watching us, so I don't. I want to make sure they heard you. So with Instagram really gaining some ground is what I'm asking. What's their role? I mean, are people really going to target them just as much as Twitter? Mm-hmm. Just kind of wondering, you know, how they play in this equation. Absolutely. What a great question. And Instagram is going to play a huge role um, in the 2020 election. Just, um, God, I think over the weekend, Friday, time moves so fast right now and stories move so fast. I can't even remember how many days ago this was, but it was days. Um, Taylor Lorenz of the New York Times um, did an expose that then got spread around. Um, It rightfully so got spread around that the Bloomberg campaign was targeting your favorite meme accounts such as Fuck Jerry. Um, can I say that on live stream? Well, well I did. <laughs> um, the uh, internet is lawless. Who, um, they, and they targeted these campaigns. So, you know, Fuck Jerry also being responsible for Fire Festival. Um, and we know how much of a success that was. But they wanted, the Bloomberg campaign was targeting your favorite meme accounts to try to get them to post pro Mike Bloomberg content. Um, so this is just one of the many ways. Instagram has also started, um, which is important to note, Instagram is owned by Facebook. They've employed um, similar uh, fact-checking measures on their site, but it has proved problematic, um, particularly for individuals who use uh, Instagram to promote their arts businesses and crafts businesses because oftentimes these images get duplicated, people take them without permission, and then the original is actually shut down as being a fake and somebody is continuing to profit off somebody else's image likeness. Um, so their fact, Instagram's fact-checking system is not perfect. Um, politicians are also reaching out, like I said, to your favorite meme accounts um, to try to gain some traction there. So it is very important um, to be wary of Instagram. We often just associate it as it being the fun influencer, cool dinner I ate account, but um, <laughs> it is also it has the same potentials for all of the things we've talked about today. Okay. Yeah. All right. No. It is. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Did you have a? No, I was. I, you I, I was going to concur heartily. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's not just friends, babies anymore, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and and what you ate for dinner, and and, and God knows what else. Um, and and therein and therein lies some of the problems. I mean, I, I saw an Instagram um, post the other day. It was very funny, mocked up picture of the founding fathers, but it was a deep fake. You know, technically. Yeah. But it was humor. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thank. Uh, join me in thanking our panelists today. We have uh, Jessica Maddox of the University of Alabama, Mark Harmon here at UT, and Damian Ruck, a postdoctoral fellow, also here at UT. And thank you all for coming as well. And we want to thank Brandon as well for oh. moderating. Yay, thank you guys, Thanks. and thank you panelists for joining us today.